everyone. Uh, we've just had a very exciting panel. Let's, uh, uh, we hope we can try to keep up the same energy as uh, the one before us. Now we're shifting into uh, clean energy and the UN Sustainable Goals. Uh, this panel uh, will have free talks by our... Uh, uh, the <coughs> by each of our uh, presenters. Uh, first, we'll have uh, Brian Corkle. Brian is a professor at the University of Texas at Austin in the Maqueda Department of Chemical Engineering and UT Austin, Portugal's Director of Nanotechnologies. Uh, then we'll have João Pessas Lopes, who is a full professor at the Faculty of Engineering of the University of Porto, Director of the Sustainable Energy Systems PhD course at FILP, and Associate Director of Inesc Tech. And finally, we'll have João Matos Fernandes, of Portugal's former um, Minister for the Environment and Climate Action, and also a professor at the University of Porto. So, Brian, uh, if you can start us off. All right. Um, great. So, will you present my slides? <laughs> There's no computer or anything up here, so. Okay, great. Um, so I'm just going to take a few minutes and talk a little bit about um, generally where the world's at on the UN sustainability goals for uh, number seven, which is clean and affordable energy. And uh, I was thinking about what to call my, my talk, so I just came up with the most grandiose title possible. Uh, I don't think I'll actually tell you how to solve all the world's uh, energy and climate challenges, but that's that's what we're what we're here talking about. So, um, so I'm Brian Corgel, uh, director of the Energy Institute at UT. So I've been doing that for about a year. I also direct a solar research center. It's called the so Center for a Solar Powered Future. So I think a lot about energy energy uh, solutions. And so um, I just pulled a, a few things from the UN Sustainability or Sustainable Development Goals Report from 2022 and a couple of highlights from that. So uh, electrification. So one of the goals for uh, Area 7, affordable and clean energy for UN Sustainability is uh, clean, and clean and affordable energy. And one of the goals is to provide electricity to everybody in the world. Okay, so right now everybody in the world does not have access to electricity. Uh, the other thing that's happening at the moment, in addition to providing everybody electricity, is uh, a drive towards electrification of our power sector, so the grid, uh, as well as heating and fuels and all of that. So we've got kind of two things happening around the world. One is let's get electricity to everyone, which they, they don't have now. Uh, but also elect electrify a lot of things to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So both of those, I would say, are, are related, but there are different business models to those. So getting electricity to rural communities in Africa is much different than electrifying a chemical refinery in uh, Houston, for example. Okay, So electrification is a, a big topic right now. And Unfortunately, you know, at the rate we're going, not everyone will have electricity by 2030. So there will still be about uh, over 500, 000, 500 million people um, without electricity. So 670 million people without electricity by 2030, unless we do something a little differently. Um, another sustainability goal is uh, access to clean cooking. Okay, so it's amazing how many people don't have access to clean cooking. And this is a huge health risk if you're uh, burning stuff in your, in your house <laughs> and breathing it every time you cook. So right now, um, at the current rate, by 2030, only three-fourths of the glo global population will have access to clean cooking. All right, and so... Um, again, that's related to goals on electrification. It's related to all the net zero goals we have. But the fact is, is that a fourth of the population of the globe is, is hurting themselves health-wise every time they, they make a meal. So how, how do we address that? Uh, another goal is um, deploying renewables. So 
one of the challenges with deploying renewables is not that the technology doesn't exist, but it's very capital intensive. So where does that money come from uh, to put in the gigawatt, the, the hundreds of gigawatts of solar that, that we need to get to net zero uh, uh, glo glo greenhouse gas emissions around the globe? So how do we do that? So that's an important part uh, of this picture. And then another part is uh, public financing for renewable energy. So again, there's, there's uh, I guess I, I sort of think about two aspects of this, is how, how are we going to get everyone the electricity, the power that they need in their lives where they don't have access to it already? And then how as a globe are we going to meet the, the greenhouse gas emission standards that we need to, to um, I don't know if you could say prevent uh, global warming, but <laughs> reduce its consequences. Okay, and so this is a challenge as well, and it's a little bit discouraging in the last couple of years that the amount of renewable adoption has been dropping uh, globally. That's not true in the United States or in Texas, but uh, apparently globally. So these are some of the major energy challenges around the world. Um, and so in the, you know, in the, the background of this, the cost of wind and solar power keeps continuing to drop. Um, again, the challenge is where do you come up with the capital to deploy it, especially in countries in Africa that don't have access to any, any electricity. The technologies exist, but how do, we, how do we get them there? Okay, so when we're thinking about energy research, it's not just developing a new, a new battery, you know, what's, the, what's beyond lithium, what's the sodium ion battery, it's also the policy, it's the finance, um, and it's the global cooperation. And that's where I think UT Portugal program can play such a huge role because this program is really about global cooperation between countries. Uh, one of the things that we think about a lot uh, at University of Texas is industrial decarbonization. So a couple of activities we have right now are looking at um, uh, electrification of power heating, for example. So if you look at where greenhouse gas emissions come from, 25% of all the greenhouse gas emissions are from industrial processes, chemical refining, steel making, cement making. And if we're talking about uh, globally, we want to be able to provide electricity to people, okay? But if, I mean, we also, want to provide materials for buildings and cars and transportation. And so right now, that, uh, those manufacturing processes have a very large carbon footprint. So how do we reduce the carbon footprint of industrial-related uh, emissions? How do we electrify all those processes? Those are, those are major challenges, and we're thinking about those a lot at University of Texas at Austin. Uh, another approach to industrial decarbonization and, and reducing emissions just overall, there's a lot of discussion about clean hydrogen right now. So what are the fuels that might be available to reduce the carbon footprint, carbon emissions? And hydrogen potentially could, could be one. And at University of Texas, we're, we're very, very strong in hydrogen research. Uh, these are two examples of uh, industry-related programs. We have one of the Department of Energy hydrogen at scale projects. There are six of those around the country. We have one at UT which is focused on demonstrating um, clean hydrogen technologies for transportation, fueling stations, all of that with a large number of uh, industry sponsors. And then we have a, a geological hydrogen storage industrial affiliates program in our Bureau of Economic Geology. So we, we've got a lot of, and then we've got like 80 faculty doing research in hydrogen all the way from electrolyzers, catalyst development, membranes uh, across campus. So this is a, a significant topic at UT right now. So electrification, power systems, huge topic. Uh, car, low carbon fuels like hydrogen is a huge topic for us at, at UT at the moment. So what are the technological advancements that we needed? Uh, or that we need on a global scale. And again, how do we, we've got these challenges of how do we bring electricity and energy to everyone around the world? How do we do that? And then at the same time, how do we lower global, globally our greenhouse gas emissions? And they're related, but they're kind of two, two separate problems in some way. So we need uh, technologies in low carbon fuels, biofuels, geothermal, carbon capture, 
um, this electrification of, of processes, transportation, uh, how do you massively upscale photovoltaics? The Biden administration uh, in the United States set a goal of 2035 to have our electrical grid be net zero carbon. Um, I mentioned this to one of our industry folks and his first reaction was like, that's impossible, that'll never happen. Um, I like to believe that we can make it happen, So, but what will it take to get our power grid to have net zero carbon emissions? And it's going to take a lot of solar, for example. Uh, how do you have a grid that can deal with that? Our, I think our, one of our major research challenges right now is long duration energy storage. So how do you do seasonal energy storage at scale? You can't do it with lithium ion batteries. How, how do you do that? And no one knows how to do that right now, but that's a huge, a huge challenge. Uh, and then, you know, electrifying everything. People think electrifying everything is the solution, but then if you do life cycle analyses and the mining and the raw materials and all of that, um, you can't just electrify everything. You have, to, you have to do more than that. So anyway, these are um, some of the research topics we're thinking about at UT and how they connect a bit to the UN sustainability goals. Thank you, Brian. We'll now have Joan Petzschwab, who is the next speaker, with a talk called Energy System of the Future, Power System with 100% Renewable Energy, The Long Wait. So, good afternoon to all of you. Um, first of all, I want to thank to the UTI um, Austin Portugal um, uh, program having invited me for this talk. I'm very happy to be here. And uh, uh, I'm going to talk about um, how the electric power systems of the future will evolve and will evolve up to um, a scenario where we will have 100% of renewable integration in the system. But uh, as I want to show you, there's a still a long story to, to face in the coming years. So, I'm sure that all of us understood that we are no longer facing climatic threats, we are facing climatic facts. Because uh, we, the climate change is a fact, so the temperature of the Earth is um, rising up, and this will create tremendous problems in terms of the meltdown of the ices in, in the Earth, and this will rise the levels of the oceans, and with dramatic consequences in the climate and the lifestyle of all the populations in Earth. So this means we have to find out solutions. And the, the very best solution to, to cope with that in, from the energy point of view is to electrify. So is to electrify the society and the economy uh, for the coming years. Of course, electrification is not the only solution. Um, we will need other energy carriers to deal with the problem, but the main uh, fact is that we need to electrify. And this is the message I want to, to pass. So this is just um, a view of what are the prospects for Portugal up to 2050. Uh, and uh, so Portugal has a very ambitious plan to, to decarbonize the economy in Portugal such that, for instance, by two, two, in two, 2030, we will have more than 80% of the electricity that is, con is going to be consumed will come up from renewable power sources. How are we going to do that? So we are investing in solar PV generation, in um, uh, wind power, and um, there is tremendous rise in these technologies, as you can see from this, uh, this, this slide. Obviously, this means large share of distributed generation, a uh, large amount of variable in time renewable energy sources, and uh, uh, obviously we will have to face other, other problems. And some of the problems that um, we will have to face is that we are building an, a system that is going to be dominated by inverters, by power electronics. This means that uh, the, the, the conventional synchronous machines are, are disappearing 
Uh, this doesn't mean that they will completely disappear from the portfolio of generation. They will still be there and we want them to be there. But the fact is that uh, this, um, this type of new generation based on power electronics is rising up and this is going to create problems in terms of inertial reduction and bringing stability problems and so on. And of course there are some other technologies related with, for instance, the reduction of short circuit levels, but uh, this is uh, something that uh, I don't want to, do, to, to develop that much here. Uh, of course, other of the challenges that uh, the power system of the future will have to face is that uh, the system has to, to face very large imbalances in the system. Uh, you can see there, uh, you can, oops, so it's not working, that's okay. So, but you can see there that um, the presence of, uh, for instance, solar PV generation will create um, big problems for the operation of the system in terms of uh, needs of balancing. The, the balancing, the needs of balancing will, will increase dramatically in the system uh, of the future. And therefore, operational reserves will be needed. At the same time, we will have to, to face difficult voltage regulation problems, especially in distribution grids. Uh, and this is um, a problem that may be uh, difficult to deal with. Um, of course, that since we are uh, developing a system of the future based on resources that are variable in time, we need to find out a way to have the demand also responding to the variations of the generation. So this means um, flexibility. The concept of flexibility is a new concept that we need to, uh, to, to bring to the operation and to the planning of the system of the future. So this means that uh, the generation units, they, they need to be capable to adapt uh, to the variations of the generation. Uh, and also, this means that load and demand needs to be adapted to the variations of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the generation, the renewable energy variation. Um, of course, consumers, in terms of behavioral changes, they have also a key role to play. And, um, we will have to, to deal with the um, generation units that have to be very fast in responding to the changes that the variation of renewable power sources brings to the operation of the system. And of course, this will be done using the so-called smart grid concept. And so the acceleration of the adoption of smart grid concepts is something that uh, will be key for the years to come. But for all this to be true, we will see that storage will be very, uh, will be really key for the development, for the success of all this development, of this futuristic view that will become reality in 20 years, 30 years from now. So this means that we will have to manage uh, so storage, and storage here must be seen as um, a multi-level, multi-technology issue. So this means that we will have to cope with um, batteries, different type of batteries, flow batteries, lithium, lithium ion batteries, um, hydro generation, reversible units. So there's a lot of, uh, of effort to be done on that uh, technology because it's a very mature technology. And um, also, we have to, to realize, and I will show you, it, you in the next slide, we will have to realize that we also need to deal with um, seasonal storage. Because, and seasonal storage is really challenging, as the previous speaker already mentioned before. So because uh, we will have to store energy for long periods of time. And uh, one of the ideas is to produce uh, hydrogen through electrolyzers using so electricity from renewable power sources and store it in salt miles, in, so, in salt caverns, I, I mean. So th this is something that soon will be uh, exploited. And I'm bringing you um, 
some simulations we have performed for the year 2030 for Portugal, where you can see in blue, um, so the, the, the load variation along the year, and uh, in green, the curtailment we, for, what we foreseen to happen in the, in, the, in the power system of Portugal uh, in eight years from now. So there's a lot of curtailment of renewable power sources because demand will not be enough for the offer of the renewable power sources. So this means that um, either we curtail or we store. And the fact is that at the same time, the system, and this is not only the case for Portugal, is everywhere, the system will still need firm capacity. Firm capacity to keep the reliability indices, to keep the security of supply. And this means that at the moment, this firm capacity is provided by thermal power plants. Like, uh, for instance, uh, in Portugal is uh, combined cycle gas turbines using natural gas. So the idea is to decarbonize also these power plants. And that w the way to do it is by using hydrogen. So that hydrogen that uh, is there curtailed, instead of being curtailed, it can be stored. And um, it is um, interesting to see, if you look at that picture, that uh, the curtailment is uh, supposed to happen more during spring and summer, while the needs of firm capacity will happen in late autumn and in winter. So this means we need to transfer energy from spring and summer to late autumn and winter. So this can be done using what I have just mentioned before in my previous slide. So storing the, the electricity, the surplus of renewable electricity via hydrogen using electrolyzers, store that hydrogen in cavern, salt caverns, and then uh, produce again uh, electricity uh, by, by using, for instance, uh, pure um, um, hydrogen turbines or fuel cells that will be, in this case, keeping the, the, providing the firm power and keeping the security of supply of the system. In this way, we will fully decarbonize the electric power system of the future. But of course, this also needs to be done using advanced grid codes. Portugal has now um, a grid code that enforces the requirements of generation, and this is extremely important, but I, I can tell you that I was involved, I, I led a group that, the, the, that uh, presented and designed a grid code for the island of Madeira, and uh, the island of Madeira has very ambitious targets for the future by increasing renewable generation, and we were very much demanding there than in Portugal main, mainland. Also, the security of supply issues, they need to be addressed very, very carefully, and there are tools to deal with that. Uh, we need better forecasting tools, because for the operation of the system, we will have to face the variability of the renewable power sources and how to cope with that, how to manage uh, the, the conventional um, portfolio of generation that will be based on hydro units. Uh, and uh, also, we have to deal with um, issues related with the online dynamic security assessment. That is, we need to monitor the robustness of the operation of the system uh, by and every, every, every minute. Of course, this will evolve in a way that uh, the interconnection capabilities will increase in all Europe. So we are developing, um, uh, soon we'll start developing an infrastructure such that we will be capable to transfer energy from the north to the south and from the east to the west and vice versa in Europe. Of course, this means the using of HVDC interconnections, and this is something that we will see uh, popping up in the coming years and also in Portugal, because if we want to exploit um, uh, wind offshore, we need to start dealing with that. And very, very important, we need to think about the market structure. So do marginal markets still make sense? So uh, we are building a system that is based on uh, renewable power sources with um, a, a cost that is almost, marginal cost that is almost zero. So uh, we need to, to think carefully if 
marginal markets still make sense. In my opinion, I think that they don't make sense, not now, but soon. Uh, we will need fast response reserve markets. We will need capacity markets, flexibility markets, new ancillary service markets. Um, and of course, we need also to deal with the, the distributed generation and the, all the, the, the exchanges of energy that may take place at the level of the um, almost consumers. So I mean, in this case, the neighbors in uh, distribution grid. So dealing with, in this case, community, energy community, uh, using, using renewable power sources. And this is my last slide with the conclusions, just to, to give you the, the one very important message that the future and the success of this vision relies on using smart players. And the smart players are there. But very important for all this success is that we also need a smart regulation. Because it is through a regulatory approach, a regulatory framework, that we will be capable to develop a stable uh, mm, uh, solution to develop from the economic point of view all these uh, uh, solutions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Joao. Uh, our, our final speaker is joining us via Zoom. Uh, uh, João Matos Fernandes will be uh, giving us a talk on energy, the Portuguese ambition. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me, João. Uh, whenever, you're, whenever you can start, go ahead. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, I hope that you can hear me well. Uh, I, uh, I do want to be with you uh, in that building. I know it very well. I was uh, the president of the Port Authority when that uh, terminal was built. So I'm really proud of the room uh, where, uh, where you are in. Uh, well, uh, I'm not the scientist at all. Uh, I'm not the scientist of energy. Uh, so my speech will be a little bit different from the two uh, who come before me. Uh, I'll show you my presentation. I hope you can see it. So, uh, I will talk about energy and the Portuguese ambition, but uh, this is not exactly a, a presentation. It could be a more similar to a speech. Uh, of course, there are many opinions uh, about it, but uh, I, uh, I was responsible for uh, for the period of change in Portugal, uh, and I will talk about it, and I will try to show how I believe this is important uh, for the future. So, what we know uh, about our planet is that it has already warmed by 1.2 Celsius degrees. Uh, we have to stop at 1.5, and we have to close to the point where we could never be back. We also know that that warming is because of us, because of our activity uh, and uh, energy uh, is really key when we try to change uh, to a better climate condition. We also know that the planet population will grow in the near future. We are more or less 7.5 billion, uh, we will become to be 10 billion uh, on 2050. And it means that the economy has to grow to give welfare to all those uh, new citizens. And when we talk about growing uh, and, and the growing of the economy, we are naturally talking about using more energy. That's why energy will always be key when we talk about climate change. We also know that the consequences of global warming are not a problem of the future. They are also a problem of the present. The deep drop that we are feeling in Portugal is really a consequence of climate change. So, in this presentation, I will talk about mitigation, about reducing emissions, carbon emissions, but we do at the same time need to adapt and we need to act right now because we are facing the problem, we are not waiting for the problem. And there's a political commitment which is very important, is that Europe uh, should be the first continent to become carbon neutral uh, on the year on 2050, and after that, we are supposed to have negative emissions. 
when we look to the environmental, to the sustainable uh, problems that we are facing, we can have two different points of view. I would say that the first point of view uh, represents the first generation of, uh, of environmental policies, which means uh, that uh, sustainability uh, come as a reactive policy to minimize the attacks of the economy, uh, that promote infrastructures like water and sanitation, uh, to promote also the public health, and to reserve spaces to promote violence. So, uh, the environmental issues are the other side of a coin that everybody should concern, but they are not exactly the focus of the changing uh, process in science. Nowadays, I do believe that it's impossible to act like that. Yes, we have some problems with the generation that we should attack and fulfill, but definitely uh, we need to look at sustainability as an active policy that promotes investments and at the same time can make the economy grow and protect the natural values. This is exactly where, where we are. About, well, less than a year, in that exactly place where you are, they were presenting the first, the first, uh, the result of the first call for the new agendas for industry in Portugal, and 80% of the projects, 80% of the investment is inside sustainability. We are talking about wind, hydrogen. We are talking about circular economy. We are talking about fire economy. We are talking about renewable uh, processes to produce electricity. So. The big investment in Portugal, when we talk about the economy, definitely we are talking about sustainability, and inside the sustainability issues, we are really talking about energy. But of course, we cannot uh, we cannot look to the future using uh, the instruments of the past. Everything has to change. When we talk about real changing, we have well, we have to stop dischargeable processes and materials. We have to stop using uh, fossil fuels and I do believe that if I believe I, I like if I think like this for many years I do believe that after the pandemic and most of all after the war uh, we I think that there are just a few people that look and think in a different way than I Portugal was the first country in the world to be carbon neutrality by who really proud of it. Uh, on 2016, on the climate COP in Marrakech, our Prime Minister said we will be uh, carbon neutral by 2050. And we build a roadmap, a very complete roadmap, a very ambitious roadmap that shows that, that this is definitely possible. And at that time, on 2015, we only use the technologies that we, are, that we know that will become mature in just a few years. When you look to this to this uh, to this picture, uh, I think that everything is running faster than we expect at that time. But anyway, a very very big change. You can see on the on the top left, uh, we produce 68 megatons of CO2, and the sink capacity of the country is about nine megatons, and we have to uh, reach 2050, producing no more than 13 megatons of CO2 and, all, and, and we have to raise the sink capacity to the, that figure. Believe me, everything in here, and we, 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 we do it for all the economy and all the subsectors, from the electricity producer to mobility uh, and with uh, uh, all the other sectors, the economic and social sectors inside, everything is, is running faster than uh, it was expected on the start. That end of coal fire, which is now on 2021, on the first picture, we told that it had to, to, to be till 2030. Uh, and at that time, when on 2050 we said that we we'll stop using coal by 2030, there's a big noise and people said it was impossible, but we did it. We did it nine years before, uh, for one year, almost for a year, it will be completed on the 30th of November. Uh, Portugal is the second country in Europe in the blue year to stop using coal to produce electricity. And we have a very good track record on emission reduction. But our goals uh, from the plan to come before me from 2005 
is to uh, reduce our emissions between 18 to 23 percent on 2050 and we reach 33 percent. We reduce in 15 years in one third our emissions. Uh, every subsector has a positive contribute for this exact agriculture. That is harder to reintroduce the technology in agriculture, but there's a lot of things to do in this subsector. And this is the evolution uh, and goals of the roadmap for total energy. I'm not talking about electricity for total energy. That uh, how things are, uh, are now uh, since 1995 to 2020. I don't have the figures of 2021. Uh, and how they have to, to pursue uh, on 2030, 2040 and on the 20th. As you can see, Oil is so sorry, uh, this is in Portuguese, but the orange uh, is oil uh, and products from oil uh, represents the, the biggest part of the, the, the total energy consumed. But we, uh, we, we end the 2020 with a 34% of the total energy was, comes from, uh, from renewable sources. The year of 2005, this year in here, uh, with the highest consumption uh, is very important because the green till that year is only electricity coming from from dams and uh, on the 20 uh, on 2005 become uh, the, the wind power uh, which raises a lot from 41 megaton to 75 megaton we almost double in 15 years and now the solar is really uh, it's just not very important nowadays, but definitely in two, three years will also become a very important source of electricity, produced electricity. As I told you, coal uh, on 2020 means almost nothing, 7%, and on 2022, it will be 0%. But it's also very important to look on the, 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 the energy, the, how we depend uh, on import of sources of energy because things are uh, much better now than they were on, on 1995 and there's a huge reduction from now to 2050. Uh, Portugal has uh, the, well, the luck to have wind, sun and uh, water, even if you have less water right now, to produce 100% of the electricity that we consume. So, as conclusion, 60% of the electricity, electricity not energy, 60% of the electricity consumed comes from renewable sources. It's an impressive figure in Europe. The, as I told you, we have water, sun, and wind to produce 100% of, of our electricity. We will anticipate the goals, the goals that you see that were, uh, that were for 2030, that the, the regulator said to us that with the, with the uh, with the investment which are already on field, mainly on solar, we will reach that goal on 2026. So, on 2026, 80% of the electricity will come from renewables. We have a problem with our grid. <coughs> we have a dysfunction grid when we talk about transport. So, we have to invest a lot and put many bets on, uh, on self-consumption both individual and collective and on energy communities. We have the law, we have the legislation. Things are now raising a lot in Portugal uh, and it is maybe much more important in the near future when you compare with the solar farms. And because of this, well, yes, that's true. Uh, the price of electricity has been <laughs> in Portugal, but to compare uh, just three cases on 2021, the price in Portugal increased 10 percent, in Spain 35 percent, and in Holland and Belgium more than 50 percent. So, when we produce electricity from renewables, we have, uh, of course, we have no uh, carbon emissions, and at the same time, we have uh, cheaper electricity for uh, for all the Portuguese. Just this is the, the price of the spot market during this year, uh, so sorry I picked it from the Spanish uh, Spanish publication, but as, as we have 
a, a, a common market for electricity when you read Spain, it means both Spain and Portugal when we are talking about the sport market. And definitely those who depend more uh, on uh, renewable sources are a much better place than all the others uh, because if you look at France with a, such a, a nuclear power to Italy, Germany, uh, the prices has raised to to values that we, that we didn't feel uh, in uh, in Portugal or in Spain. So this is really important for uh, also for the economy. And when we look to the, to the future of those prices, definitely, uh, definitely the renewable sources are uh, the best for the environment, the best for the society, and the best for the economy. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Fernandes. Uh, please uh, stay on for the, the discussion. Uh, I'll start with uh, Brian. In your uh, presentation, you talked about uh, electrifying, the need to electrify uh, our well, way of living, so to say. Uh, can our grids today sustain such a uh, high level of electrification? And if not, what, what has to be done to, to make our grids more stronger and uh, more uh, flexible? And also, uh, what role does nuclear play, if any, now that we're going into a renewable uh, world? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I guess I'll answer the first question. Uh, so, so the grid, first of all, the grid is all electrified because <laughs> it's electricity. It's a, the power grid. Um, I think when people talk about um, electrification of everything, they're thinking about um, how do you reduce... EVs. Yeah, how do you reduce greenhouse gas emissions overall? So instead of getting your electricity from natural gas-fired power plants, you go with renewables like solar, wind. So there are two aspects of electrification related to the grid. One is the introduction of more renewables. You know, so, so solar, for example, not only is the power output fluctuating each day, like during daytime versus night, it's seasonal also, so there's much more sunlight in the summer than the, than the winter. And so the, that intermittency, those fluctuations, you have to deal with them somehow, and the grid is not set up to deal with those major power fluctuations uh, at the moment, which are unpredictable a lot of times. So um, when people talk about electrification, um, one, the goal is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by more renewables, introduces this challenge of intermittency and unpredictability. But the other aspect is that, so our energy use is uh, half of its power or electricity, the grid, and the other half is fuels and, you know, gasoline and all of that. So if you can add more renewables that are lower greenhouse gas emissions to the grid, and then you can electrify processes that, like your cars, that instead of burning gas, now you have an electric vehicle, you get that electricity from the grid that's powered by renewables, you're lowering pretty dramatically the overall greenhouse gas emissions. So that, that's the reason people are looking at, um, talking about the grid electrification so much, is it can provide a route to lower greenhouse gas emissions, but with the problems of intermittency and, and all of that, that you need some sort of seasonal storage or storage of some sort uh, to deal with. So to your uh, question about nuclear, so nuclear is, is uh, low carbon fuel. It, you can look at, I mean, you have a lot of nuclear waste and, and other issues. Um, some of the challenges with nuclear are the permitting costs. Um, just the cost of, of the power, um, safety concerns in the, from the public, things like that. There are emerging new technologies people are exploring. So at the University of Texas, we have a, a strong program on small modular nuclear reactors looking at molten salt uh, as a way to have sort of safer, maybe lower cost nuclear. And there's a, a significant program on that uh, UT Austin with Texas A&M and Abilene University or something. So, so we actually do have research forward looking on nuclear as well. But I think nuclear is, I mean, it's an di entirely different discussion for a variety of reasons. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, speaking of, of, of storage, uh, Jean-Paul you, you've talked about how we can use the excess production of uh, renewables to produce green uh, hydrogen. Uh, how, how, do you, how strategic do you think for Portugal is the production of green hydrogen, and should we also look for the production of blue hydrogen using uh, natural gas with carbon capture? Okay. Well. <clears throat> Um, first of all, we have to understand that the decarbonization of the economy is not going to be done only by electrifying, as I said before. So obviously, electrification is the main uh, target and the main uh, approach to deal with this problem, but um, hydrogen is also um, a vector, an energy vector, that should be exploited because there are some um, consume consumptions that um, are not capable to be um, decarbonized on the basis of el the electricity only. So, and I can say some of them, like uh, for instance, uh, ceramics, um, uh, so um, cements. So uh, all the industries that rely on the high temperature uh, heat. Um, the, we, we cannot solve the problem only by using uh, electricity. And so we, we need to go for hydrogen. And obviously hydrogen can be used also for transportation. Um, and uh, obviously there, there is um, a, a place for uh, hydrogen to be used in transportation and for electricity. Uh, so there is room for both. Um, and obviously we, we need to, to produce green hydrogen for this purpose. Or can be blue hydrogen, but I will I will talk about that afterwards. But so and this hydrogen will be obtained by electrolysis of water using renewable power sources. And but here it is important to understand that this hydrogen is not only going to be the one that I mentioned before. That is um, so in, related with the case of. The, some surpluses of uh, uh, renewable electricity that may, may have not um, demand to, full, to, to, to fulfill. So, and, and for those cases, um, obviously we need dedicated power plants, uh, solar PV um, plants, uh, wind parks, that will produce electricity to, 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 to large-scale electrolyzers, to, to feed the needs of the industry, to need the, the, the needs of the economy on hydrogen. The, the idea that I presented before is more related with the fact that we have a problem in the electric power system that is we need always to have firm capacity. And this firm capacity, as I described, is presently mainly obtained from fossil fuel power plants, like in Portugal, uh, combined cycle gas uh, turbines. Um, and uh, what, I, what I would like to, I try to, to show is that we can also decarbonize this type of generation by using hydrogen. And this hydrogen can be exactly related with the one that, the, with the electricity that can be curtailed just because there is no demand for that. And this is always a problem of demand. If there is no demand, we, the, 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 obviously um, there is a surplus and this electricity will be curtailed. So instead of being curtailed, we store it and uh, we can produce uh, hydrogen for this purpose. I'd like to go back to the, the storage, but first I, I'd like to ask João uh, Matos Fernandes a, a question. In your uh, presentation, uh, it was titled uh, The Energy uh, the Portuguese Ambition. Uh, shouldn't we be even more ambitious now that uh, uh, we're going to have 80% of renewables by 2026? Shouldn't we be more ambitious and uh, lower our target to maybe 2040 or 2045? Well, uh, I, it's hard for me to hear your question, uh, but uh, I think that you asked if you can, can we be more ambitious, uh, more ambitious than what we are being. Is that so? Yes, that, that, that's correct. Okay, well, I repeat, we were the first to assume that we will become targeted to one century. Europe comes after us. We have to reduce 85% of, of our emissions compared with 2005. Why 2005? Because it's the era of the peak of emissions in Portugal. 
And uh, in 35 years, reducing 85% of emissions, I think that is really a very, very big vision. Uh, and we made uh, that the carbonization is really the, 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 the main, the main uh, transversal process that we assume as a country. Uh, and we believe that if we do so, it's obviously it's good for our commitment uh, with the world because of climate change, and, but especially good for our economy. In the roadmap, uh, we studied three different scenarios and the scenario that can uh, assure us that will become carbon neutral on 2050 is really the one where the economy grows more. So it means about an investment of 2 billion euros plus than the scenario of business as usual. And this is definitely what we are doing. As I told you during the presentation, the goals of 2040, oh, and just for you to have an idea, become carbon neutral, it doesn't mean zero emissions, but it means zero emissions on 2050 on two subsectors. The mobility, zero emissions for the mobility, and zero emissions for the electricity production. Uh, and as I told you, that we have the goal of 80% of the electricity produced from renewable sources on 2030, and we will reach that, that goal on 2026. So, can we be carbon neutral before 2050? Maybe yes, maybe yes. But the roadmap has only uh, five years, six years, and I believe that we can make a better one uh, in no more than three or four years. But I don't know many countries in the world, I don't, I don't even know many countries in Europe with such a, 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 a strong roadmap to show all the society and all the sectors of the economy that it's really important to become carbon neutral on 20. And uh, I would say that uh, that speech, uh, this speech, this commitment, uh, and the, the track record that we have, it's really important for Portugal and for Europe when we look to the world economy. Because if we talk about, if we talk about IT, uh, I think that it's hard uh, or it's easy to, to understand that the North Americans and on Asia, they run much faster than we did. But uh, if we talk about climate change, definitely Europe is the leader uh, of the transformation. So uh, we have uh, all the things to be on the top of this transformation also for the world. Uh, Brian, in your presentation, you talked about how storage was one of the main issues uh, regarding renewables. Yeah. Is, is hydrogen the solution, or do you see uh, other solutions for this uh, problem? Um, people are thinking about hydrogen, for sure. Um, all the way from pumping water up a hill. Um, there's a, a new startup company that has, like, weights and levers, and I'm forgetting the name of this company now. Uh, using mechanical energy, um, I mean, people are thinking about a lot of different things. What what will not work is a whole bunch of lithium ion batteries. I mean, because that can't store the electricity over the course of uh, several months, basically. But um, yeah, it's it's a really open-ended question because not only do you need something that stores the electricity for a long time, it needs to be low low cost, but also the scale of what you're talking about is enormous. Um, so yeah, it's it's a really open-ended question right now. Uh, so uh, this question is uh, for uh, well, for all three of you, but uh, more for, for João. Uh, um, do you see that uh, hydrogen as a solution more for countries like the size of Portugal, uh, or uh, so it could be like a strategic area for us, but not when we're talking about Texas or the U.S. Or do you think it could be uh, something that could be used uh, with other technologies to help? Uh, well, solve this. Uh, for storage. Yes, for storage. Yes. Well, first of first of all, let me just answer something that you asked me before, and I have not uh, uh, answered. That was on blue hydrogen. Yes. Okay. The, well, um, regarding blue hydrogen and green hydrogen, this is all about economics, and uh, uh, well, the present studies that exist show that um, green hydrogen will be more um, economic than. Um, blue hydrogen. And so this, this solves the, the problem. <laughs> this gives you the answer for your question. 
Well, regarding the, the storage uh, question, so, um, well, as I, as I presented in my, in my, my initial talk, uh, storage is a problem that will be solved using different technologies according to the time um, horizon for which we, we, we have to deal with. So if we, have, if we want to, to transfer energy uh, inside the, a day, for instance, so transferring energy from uh, just a few hours, store energy for just a few hours, batteries, different type of batteries, are the solution. If we, if we need to store energy um, on the basis of um, dealing with within a um, daily cycle or even a week cycle, then hydro, hydro pumping, which is a very mature technology, is the solution. And we will see in the coming years um, the retrofitting of existing uh, hydro uh, plants that will be capable, uh, will be so retrofitted to be capable to, to also to pump water and to work un, under a, a reversible cycle. And of course, hydrogen is the solution, in my opinion, for long-term storage, for seasonal storage. And I think that this is not only a problem of Portugal, this is a problem of uh, all the countries. Um, if they uh, start uh, increasing the amount of renewable electricity in, in the grid. I have been in Holland last week on a, in a conference, and there were some studies from International Energy Agency saying that um, from the moment we have power systems with uh, more or about 80% of renewable generation in the system, we need to deal with seasonal storage. And so this is something that we are about to face in Portugal. We have 60% now, soon we will be more than 80%. So this is something that we have to start dealing with very, very soon. And this, as I said, is not only a problem of Portugal. It's a problem of any country that is facing this challenging and is solving it using uh, renewable generation based on uh, resources that are variable in time. So they, they can be forecasted, but we cannot do long-term forecasts. I can do forecasts for uh, 24, hour, 24 hours ahead, 48 hours ahead. They have a error, that's okay, we, I can manage with that. But for long-term forecasts, we, cannot, we, we, we are not capable to deal with it. And so, uh, in this way, we really need seasonal forecasting, uh, sorry, uh, seasonal uh, storage, long-term storage. Uh, uh, we are almost out of time, but we still have time for, for a couple <laughs> of questions. Uh, João Matos Fernandes, uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, well, Portugal has obviously a, a, a long and a very good relationship with Spain when it comes to energy. We uh, share, we basically share a grid. However, it's not the same with the rest of the EU. What can Portugal do uh, within the European Union? to sell more energy to, to France and other countries? Or are we stuck uh, uh, with, with Spain and maybe, Northern, maybe sh looking for, uh, to Northern Africa? So sorry, I'm waiting that someone writes the question. Uh, oh. Okay. Uh, Portugal and Spain, we have a single market. So we uh, work together to talk about import or export from Spain, uh, it's not quite exactly. Uh, that's true that in this month, uh, the recent month, because we don't have water in dams, we import uh, more energy, uh, more electricity, sorry, than normal, but uh, it's for, not exactly for technological problems, we can produce that electricity from gas, it's because it was cheaper to import it from Spain. Uh, but yes, uh, we depend a lot on Spain if we want to look to the center of Europe. Uh, we, uh, Professor Bessens Lopes talk about green hydrogen, and I believe that with the, the, the capacity that Portugal has to produce green hydrogen at such a low cost, uh, we will, will transform the paradigm that Portugal has always import energy and we can export energy. And yes, we depend on Spain. Uh, Spain is a partner, Spain is also uh, someone who can compete with us 
because they may have the same natural conditions to produce electricity from renewables and to produce with hydrogen with such a low cost price. Well, we both are in Europe and I believe that Europe will have to, to play a role uh, on, this, on those decisions. We are now discussing the opportunity to build a pipeline from Portugal through Spain to France and to Germany and we have a big support from Germany and we are working together with Spain but France is against. Uh, France is against because they want to protect the, 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 the nuclear power that they have with a lot of problems that nuclear has been bringing to them. And the last slide that I show you, it's the, the best proof that uh, nuclear is not the solution uh, when we are talking about low prices. And the new nuclear, it is also not a solution. Uh, we have many uh, reverted subsidies on the past for fossil fuels, and I believe that we will have those subsidies to, to put on the, the, the nuclear energy, the nuclear electricity, if they can, if they want to be inside the market in the near future. So, I think that Europe together uh, have to find the better solutions. We know that we shouldn't depend on Russia. Uh, we know that we shouldn't replace Russia uh, from the United States to import that energy. We know that all the other markets that can sell energy to Europe are, all, all of them are very unstable, even in the north of Africa. So we have to be much more independent and Portugal and Spain have an important role in here and we work together. Uh, we, uh, do we always have success working together? No, we do not. But uh, we have many success together and I believe that we need to have Thank you. Uh, before the kick is out of the stage, uh, does anyone in the audience have a question to our speakers? We have one in the back. Hi. Uh, so I, I'm an aerospace engineer, so nothing to do with renewables. Uh, in any case, um, I've been following this market for quite a bit, uh, probably over f 10 to 15 years. One of the things that has struck me all the time, especially relating to Portugal, is that the, the solar potential for Portugal is among the best in Europe. Uh, but perhaps Cyprus is comparable, Spain, and not much more. But uh, when we see the amount of uh, power installed in Portugal, it's is, uh, equivalent to less than what the Netherlands has installed in 2021 and 2020. It's about, um, uh, let's say, a country like Germany in 2014 had 50% of, of uh, solar power at some point. Uh, why have we uh, fallen behind in this and uh, what are we doing uh, to, to overcome this situation uh, uh, for the future? And it's for who? For which Sorry? of the speakers? Um, <laughs> to any of the three, but uh, potentially to uh, Professor João Matos Fernandes, who has been a, a minister for a, a while and probably would know more about the, the situation. Okay, thank you. Uh, João, I, I don't know if you heard the, the, the question. Uh, no, I have, I have to wait if someone writes the question. So sorry. Okay. Um, so, I only listen that the question is also for Professor Schwab, so I want to, maybe if he has to first, I can understand the question. Well, okay. <laughs> okay, I can try to answer. Well, it is a fact that we have the best, one of the best resources in solar, for solar PV generation in Europe, definitely yes, especially in the south of Portugal, obviously. Um, and in fact, if we looked at the scenario that exists in Europe, uh, we are somehow delayed. It, it is a fact. But this is changing. This is changing. We are um, investing a lot on solar PV generation. And um, uh, so if presently we have about 1,500 megawatts installed capacity, more or less, so the targets are for more than 9,000 megawatts in 2020. So this is a tremendous jump in the coming years. Of course, that this is also very much related with the pace uh, that we can give to the, to, the, to the permits, for instance, 
for, to the permits that allow for the installation of new solar PV generation. Well, let me tell you that I just read a, um, a new saying that the Portuguese government, um, uh, so um, there is a law from today that says that uh, there is a simplification procedures to install solar PV generation. So we will uh, definitely um, be on the same pace as the rest of Europe in a few years. But it is a fact, and this is something that needs to be solved. So these large investments on solar PV generation is, needs to take place and is taking place. Okay? But this is not a single solution, okay? Because if we want to electrify, yes, and in, this, in the same way we are going to increase the amount of, of consumption, electricity consumption in Portugal, for instance, the, the transportation sector. If we look at the transportation sector, the mobility sector, we want to e mobility, electric mobility to rise up. So this is going to create a large increase in the demand of electricity for the coming years. So, okay, we want to electrify, but at the same time, the, the, the demand is going to increase largely. And this is not only a problem of Portugal, it's a problem everywhere in the developed world. So for that, we need renewables, more renewable power sources. This means we need also, we are looking here at the ocean, we need to go for uh, offshore wind power. Uh, Brian, would you like to add anything well, before we finish? Um, I would just say in, in Texas, people ask the same thing. So Texas has tremendous solar resources, especially the west part of, uh, west part of the state. And Texas uh, was doing a lot of wind development around 2000, 1998. Um, so a lot of wind, but almost no solar. And people ask the exact same question you were asking. What, what is going on with Texas? Why, isn't, why aren't people installing solar? And then what happened is around 2010, a lot of people realized they could make a lot of money by installing solar. And now we're second uh, in solar power generation statewide in the US and about to exceed California. So it, it'll, it'll happen, I, I think, in Portugal. I think it just takes a recognition of what the business opportunities are, really, more than anything. And if there are tax incentives in place, that, all, that also helps um, additionally. So from, from the governmental side in Portugal, there are, I mean, if you want to catalyze the you know, installation, implementation of solar in Portugal, some small tax incentive can go a long way also. Thank you. I would have loved to, to stay here and talk more, but sadly we are out of time. Uh, oh. uh, okay, okay. Uh, just to say two or three things. When, when we said before 2020 that we're going to have 80% of electricity coming from the roof on 2030, it means that we have to double the capacity that we have on that time. And double the capacity means multiply by at least eight the, 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 the solar production. Uh, we are in the very, very low figures in Portugal, we produce less less electricity coming from solar if you compare with Belgium. So we do need to uh, grow a lot of it. And we are doing that. Uh, I think that uh, Mr. Schwab have already given you the figures, but we are, uh, we are all, well, last year it was about 600 megawatts, this year almost one gigawatt coming from solar. So things are really running fast. But uh, when, we, uh, when we build the roadmap, we didn't have the idea that the, the, that the offshore wind could come as fast as it will come. Uh, on the, the figure that I show you, I was talking about uh, less than one gigawatt on 2030 coming from offshore. And definitely, we will have five gigawatt coming from offshore wind on 2030. And it's going to be a very, very big help because, as you know, the times uh, you produce electricity from the sun and from offshore wind are really different. The offshore wind is really important at the end of the day, which is uh, when the time when the sun uh, production uh, decreases. Uh, so uh, this is brand new uh, in Portugal, and it will be really important, mainly because of another thing. It's completely impossible to produce more than one gigawatt in land in Portugal. 
uh, we are always uh, we are always doing something bad on the environment on land when we want to have big projects. And people want the decarbonization, want the electrification, want the electricity coming from renewables, but they don't like solar panels. Uh, it happens, of course, in many different, uh, in almost all the, 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 sub the sub segments of the society, in many, many other issues. They always want to have a subway, but they don't want to have a subway. So, uh, this is what we are facing. So, if we want to have big projects, we have to do those projects on sea and not on land. On the um, so the qu question was about developing countries. So, um, ha you know, what what's the strategy there? All of our questions, the discussion was mostly about Portugal, maybe a little bit about Texas. So, what what are the what are the things we need to do to get, you know, electricity to people who don't have it? Yeah. Well, I I would like to say a few words about that. Uh, <clears throat> a few years ago. I went to, I was invited to go to Zurich for one of those events, North and South, North and South uh, economies and development. And I was at that time selling the idea of microgeneration and microgrids and using renewable, renewable resources, especially because I was thinking that in Africa, of course, they have uh, small villages and uh, so they would need that type of solution. And um, uh, then someone come, came and said to me, look, I'm coming from uh, Ethiopia, and uh, in, uh, in, 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 in Addis Ababa, um, the shortage of electricity, the shortage of energy, electric energy, is such that we have electricity uh, only for just a few hours a day, and we uh, go around the city like that. So we cannot solve our problem using that solution. We, re we need to go for uh, thermal generation because we need fast uh, supply of energy for our needs, for our economic development. And it is a fact. This, this is something that we need to, to deal with and um, to realize that in those countries, um, uh, we have to find out solutions to help them to, to develop solutions that are based on renewable power sources to, f to, f to feed the needs of, uh, of the demand, the local demand. But we realize that when we do that, we, we need a very sophisticated and developed system with new tools, new uh, solutions that are uh, somehow relying on um, a mature uh, economy, which they don't have. So the only way to deal with that is to, 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 to finance, to help them financing those solutions. Yeah, so th this is my opinion, but... Uh... Well, I'll just say, um, I think it's a bit of a chicken and the egg problem. So uh, energy use tracks on with economic productivity. So countries that have high GDPs and all that have very high energy use and, and vice versa. So for, uh, for countries to have strong economies, you need a lot of energy, uh, but in order to get that energy, you need the strong economy. So I think that's, that's where, the, where the challenge is. I think, I mean, I think the, the discussion about, oh, all, all the new energy generation and uh, different countries has to be low carbon, I think is, is a little bit misguided. It's sort of like, you know, why don't we think about the real societal challenges, about economic development, empowering people, and energy is part of that equation. So I think the discussion needs to be broader than just, hey, how do we, how do we build a little microgrid for, the, for some little city somewhere else? It's like, how do we actually enable cultures, communities, and everyone to benefit from economic growth in the same way globally? I think that's really the question. So uh, this was our panel. Uh, thanks again, Brian, Jean, and Jean. Thank you.